Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Sad to join you today as we discuss another portion of God's Word, and here with today we're talking about the unity that should exist within the church and among Christians. You know, we at the Lord's body are commanded to be united. Jesus prayed in John 17 that we would be as united as He and the Father were united, as they were one. In Ephesians chapter 4, we find what we often call the seven ones. That is really the basis of unity. Why should we be united? Well, we should be united because there are seven ones that we're going to briefly discuss today. The first one, of course, is found in verse 4 where it said there is one body. This one body is the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, And he gave all things, excuse me, and he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him which fills all in all. Notice here, Paul plainly says that the body of Christ is the church, or the church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of that body, which implies absolute authority. And then we as Christians then are members of that one body. But in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul compared this physical body, the church, to the physical body. And he said, just as the physical body has many members, so we also as the spiritual body of Christ are made up of many members, that is, of many Christians. You see, Jews and Gentiles are all united in one body with a unity of beliefs. Now, the modern world says this one body is what sometimes people call the unseen church. That is, the universal church. You cannot really see that church. The denominations which claim allegiance to Christ then are the visible groups which make up the unseen church. And thus, in their minds, the one body he's talking about is this universal church made up of all the different denominations and all the different beliefs. In their minds, then, we could thus be members of any church, or no church at all for that matter, and still be a part of that one unseen body. But is there a distinction between the physical body or the seen church, the different congregations, and the unseen church. Well, we won't find it in the New Testament anywhere. For example, in Acts 2, verse 47, when Paul when he said that the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved, what church were they added to? Were they added to the local congregation in Jerusalem, or were they added to the universal church? Well, of course, it was both. Uh, They were automatically added to the local congregation in Jerusalem. And then, of course, where they're automatically part of this universal church. You see, this effort to just make a distinction between the church or the body of Christ is a modern effort to rationalize how we can all be supposedly one and be united and yet at the same time be so very divided and teach contradictory doctrines. You see, the individual parts here are individual Christians. They're not referring to different bodies, all teaching and practicing a different belief. We are one body. Now, one body all works together. And then it continues on in verse 4, there is only one spirit. This one spirit, of course, has revealed to us this one truth. In John 16 and verse 13, The Apostle John wrote, quoting the words of Jesus, He said, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, that he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. 
Notice here we find the spirit of truth, the one spirit, is guiding the apostles into the one truth. He said he would guide them into all truth. His function then was to give the perfect word, the gospel, to mankind. And since there's only one spirit, then we can, know, we can expect that he would give only one set of teachings. And he does not contradict himself. Now, in today's world, again, we find many religious groups all claiming to follow the Bible, yet they all have contradictory beliefs. Many claim to have modern-day revelations of the Spirit, yet those revelations often contradict one another. We must, despise, we must reject all such claims. We must go back to simply the Bible. The Bible should be understandable to us, and the Bible was revealed by the one Spirit, which we know then he would not teach contradictory things, nor would he reveal different beliefs to different people. We are to be united, and we should be united because there's only one Spirit who gave us the Word. Then he continued by saying there's only one hope. And we're called to this one hope by the gospel. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Paul says, To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been called by the gospel. And the calling that we have, the hope that we have, is, of course, eternal life. In Titus 1 verse 2, Paul said, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before time began. So this one hope that we have is the hope of eternal life. It's a living hope. It is a sure and steadfast hope. One reason for the much division and the squabbling it, that we have is because we have lost sight of this one hope, and we begin to live for today. We look back to where we came from rather than where we're going. The Corinthians look back to where it converted them. The Corinthians look back to their teacher or the one who baptized them or the one who converted them, and therefore that led to great division among the body of Christ in Corinth. And they should not have been looking back. They should have been looking forward to the one hope that they all had. Then we come to verse 5, and he said, There is only one Lord. This one Lord, of course, means our authority. There is only one authority that we should have in our life, and that is Jesus Christ. In Acts 2 and verse 36, Peter, in his gospel sermon, said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So the idea of Lord, of course, means authority, as we've said. We all belong to Christ. We all belong to this one body, and Christ cannot be divided, and that one body cannot be divided. Since there is only one Lord, that is, one authority, there must of necessity be only one church, and all in the church then would teach basically the same doctrine. Division comes when men refuse to submit to that one authority. And then Paul continues by saying there's only one faith. The modern world said this one faith is an individual's personal faith. But this one faith is the body of belief that we have, the body of teaching to which we all submit. In Acts 6 and verse 7, for instance, it says that a great company of a priest were obedient to the faith. Jude encourages us to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered. God gave apostles and teachers and prophets and so forth to the church to bring it into the unity of the faith. Chapter 4, verse 11 and 13. So there can be unity only when men listen to the completed, revealed gospel of Christ as given by the one Spirit. So there should be one faith. That's the one body of belief that has been revealed to us. And then there has been one baptism. Now the modern world, of course, has redefined this one baptism, made it into a number of different baptisms. 
To some, this one baptism is the Holy Spirit baptism, which gives individuals miraculous gifts. To some, it's the new birth by which the Spirit makes us Christians. Then there is a water baptism, which is a sign of the new birth, which has already taken place and performed in various ways. That makes at least three baptisms, maybe more if you divide the baptisms up into sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, which are different ways of baptizing people today. So while there's three or maybe more baptisms in a modern world, Paul said there's only one. This one baptism is the baptism in water by which we enter the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, Paul said, For by one Spirit we're all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, or whether slaves or free, and all been made into drinking one Spirit. So this one baptism is the water baptism, which is for the remission of sins, according to Acts 2.38. And it is one in manner, that is, is it is an immersion or a burial. There are no different modes of baptism. Baptism, the word baptism, means immersion. Therefore, since it means an immersion, then you cannot substitute something else for it and call it baptism. There's only one body, and there's one baptism. Therefore, there's one way to enter the church or the body. But someone says, such a conclusion does not unite, but it divides to people. The one baptism promotes division rather than unity. But it only causes division when men refuse to accept the simple Bible teachings. You see, in the New Testament, there is no controversy over baptism. In the New Testament, it is expected and assumed that everybody who became a Christian would be baptized, and they would be immersed. That was the mode of baptism we find in the New Testament. Baptism only causes division when we refuse to submit to this one simple truth. So there's one baptism, and then finally, there is only one God. This is the great truth of the entire Bible. This one God is the Father of all. In 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6, Paul said, Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So we find in this passage that God is above and over all, that is, expressing the supremacy of God. And then we find that God is through all, that is, by providence, he upholds all, and God is in all, that is, God dwells in the church, his holy temple, and we are part of his church. We as Christians are part of the church, his, his holy temple. And so God is dwelling in each one of us. This one God is dwelling in us. But also then this Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead. Now we don't have time to get into that. But the Bible points out that Jesus is God. In John 1 verse 1, for instance, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ as the Word is part of this one God. So here we find the seven ones, which are the basis of unity. Not really so much the basis as seven reasons why we should be united, because there's only seven ones. If there's only one God, one faith, one baptism, and so forth, then why should we be divided? If there's only one body, one set of faith, then how can we be divided and still be part of of this one body and still be pleasing to God. So we hope that this will encourage you to seek for unity, to seek to, to strive for the unity in the bond of peace, to keep the unity of the spirit, the unity of the body of Christ to which we all became members when we were baptized into this body of Christ for the mission of our sins. I hope this lesson would encourage each one of you to strive for this unity that should exist among Christians. Thank you. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth.
and you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course, kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, PO Box 15, Ar Study Madurai 625016, Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420. 9244214421 God bless you The Church of Christ salutes you